in here. Well, you're, you guys are refreshing my memory on a lot of things. Uh, my name is Patrick Kelly, and uh, I'll give you the short version because we're all long-winded up here, but <coughs> I'll be short. <laughs> I, start with, I was uh, one of the first health educators, not just in New Jersey, but in the country. Uh, I always say, and some people may disagree, but I always say thank God that they recognize the disease as a white gay disease first. Even though there, we knew that there were people that were dying, but we didn't know what they were dying. There were African American Latinos dying as well, but we didn't know what it was from. So I say that because that's how we wanted to get money. Because somebody, uh, you know, the gay white kids, they weren't from, they weren't underserved or underprivileged. They were people of privilege. And their mothers was telling their, them, them congressmen and all them senators and everybody, you better do something for my child or you can't come up in here tonight. So from out of nowhere, all this money finally came through the Center of Disease Control through Atlanta. And they funded three places first. They funded San Francisco, New York City, and New Jersey. And people say, well, why New Jersey? New Jersey's right next door to New York. And the reason why was because the mode of transmission in everywhere else in the world was through sex. But the major mode of transmission in New Jersey was through IV drug use. Right, right. So what happened was I, at the time, was working as a therapist counselor in a drug residential treatment facility, openly gay, so they knew. <coughs> So they, uh, the state came and said, we have this money, we need to do this and do that. So that's how they came to me at my job and they all asked me if I wanted to do it. I said, sure. Didn't know what I was getting into at the time. Had no idea that how vicious this thing was going to become. And then when you start to think about sex, drug, sex, drug, sex, drug, crossing over the line, you know, black, white, everybody interacting with each other, I'm not surprised that the numbers are where they're at today. But the main job that I had was to go out and get people. Hospitals, like they say, would not take ambulances, would pick people up and find out they had HIV and would literally drop them on the ground and leave them. Would actually leave them there. People were living in hotels out on the, uh, outside of the hotels, on the motels on the uh, New Jersey Turnpike. I had to go get people up in roofs that was in projects and living up on the top of the roofs because they're families. Now, I knew families wouldn't kick the kids out for nothing but by doing drugs and everything. As soon as they heard AIDS, they started kicking them out. So my responsibility was there was only three places that I could take them. It was St. Uh, Saint Michael's <clears throat> University and the drug treatment program. And that was a Catholic organization in Patterson, New Jersey, called Straight and Narrow. So that's what I was. That's what I was doing. Pete, you said green, but they were. Well, they was telling. They was naming that thing a whole bunch of things: the Slim Disease, the Waist Syndrome. There was a whole lot of things that was going on at that time that was really sad. I didn't know. I didn't know what to do. I was really, really petrified about what I was seeing. How, I mean, I saw, I'm talking about women. I saw women walking around in the drug program with their hair. The hair were falling out. A guy would weigh 210, 210 on Monday and weigh 150 on Saturday. You know, and I, it sounds like an exaggeration, but that's how this disease was, was literally taking, uh, taking people away. So, sorry. Oh, look Mm. Mm. <laughs> Do your bell phone. Get them out of your way. Yeah, put your cell phones on vibrate. Let somebody make love to you tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so I was in, a, I was in a, a tough situation. So all of a sudden, my <coughs> job had went from from a therapist to a health educator, and um, I had to, I, I found myself actually having to go into the schools. Educating them was funny because the teachers thought I was just there for the students. Because somehow they were excluding themselves until I woke them up and said, wait a minute, how many people in this room are having sex? I said, including the adults. I said, well, each and every one of you are at risk for contracting this disease. So I wind up coming to Rutgers. I told you I need a short version. I wind up coming to Rutgers to do a presentation. And I met this wonderful man here, Dean Creedle. And, uh, 
after that, I became an activist. Uh, I became every, everything, you know, everything. I was the first, uh, I was the first chair for Project Five, both. Uh, God, Lord Jesus, it was just so, it was just so, so, so much that we did. But the important thing that I wanted to really speak about for Paul, what really grabbed me was it wasn't so much the uh, the trophies and the money for the ball. When we first started Project Fire, every category in the ballroom had something to do with HIV education and prevention. Every house had to come up with some, remember Bernie, the creativity? Had to come up with some creativity <laughs> on how. So what we were doing, we were, we were letting them have fun, but also teaching them at the same time that it was important. And, on, and also at the ball, we didn't just have the ball, we also had access. We had all the organizations, the health departments and them that were, uh, that were offering these services, whether it was for rent, help them with rent, help them with medication, to get them wherever they could. Well, back that time, they only had one thing, and that was AZT. AZT was the only cop pill that they had. And that drug was a mess, was a mess because the only people, I, I don't really want to say a mess, I, I'll say that what they did was the only people that was in the trial for AZT, which was a quick trial and a quick sample of the drug, was gay white men. And they saw some reaction in the gay white men, so that's when they started giving it as well to the, to the blacks and the Latinos. Now, some people may say they killed them, though it wasn't, it wasn't what it was supposed to do, but I don't, have any, I don't have any proof that they did those things, but that was the first drug, AZT. And the funny thing about it, they had it locked up for nine years couldn't no one else make a cocktail. Remember that? No one else could make that cocktail. But AZT was just like methadone when they first started uh, treating heroin addicts for methadone. They didn't know how much to give them. They, right. was, they were walking out like zombies. They right. were giving them so much. Remember so much the eyes would get crossed? Oh, yes. Like the drug was so strong, you literally, your eyes would go cross. And mm -hmm. I mean, like, I'm looking at you and your eyes start moving like this. And you're like, what the hell? Yeah. And that was, the, the medicine was, whoa. Yeah. They didn't know the right doses. No, they didn't. No. So the, the short thing is that, I'm, I wish I could take short, but the thing that really gets to me is, is that the numbers that they have, they, even though they don't surprise me, it still saddens me. There's too many people still dying. There's too many people still getting infected with this disease. And I would just hope that, um, I'm old now. I know I don't look it, but I am. I'm, up there. I'm retired now. I actually flew in from, uh, from Florida because the people asked me to. Oh, on your private jet, uh, on your private jet, Deacon. So, uh, you know, and um, I just want to try to do as much as I possibly can. Anytime I can get a chance to speak on the importance of what I always do, I always reach out to you, to all of you. I'm not Edie I mean, but I'm going to say this. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. There is no middle ground. You have to do something. This disease is continuously getting worse. Our government are cutting grants more and more and more, and it's not surprising to me because the numbers are changing. It's no longer white gay men up here and everybody else is here. It's white gay men are here, and you have the Latin and the African American and the women who are moving up fast, who are catching up fast. So we need to really try to, if you do anything tonight, if just walk away and asking yourself, what can I do? What can I do to help? Because God knows we need the help from all of you. And uh, I'll have plenty more to say. My jacket is this long, but I don't want to do it all. Well, I, I've just been asked, and I think that we, we, will, we, will, we will do that uh, very quickly. I've just been asked, we have some special guests here tonight, the youth who are in the panel today. But they have to leave pretty quickly. And we had asked them if they would come and do a quick performance. So after all of this heavy duty stuff, why don't we have them do a quick performance? Yeah. A, little, a little levity here. That don't take away from the seriousness of the discussion. But we'll show you what you're doing. Benny, will you do that for us? Performance categories, but different genres. Well, we're giving them the bad news that you see maybe six months later, you don't even recognize that this is how fast they would deteriorate. Remember the baby hair? Yes. Um, well, yeah. Caucasians probably don't know this, right. but the sisters, the black people over here, y'all know what baby hair is. Yeah. When you get there, when they used to wear it down the side. Okay. But that was, but that was, <laughs> but you know that was the sign that even if you yeah. didn't get tested, That's you knew that something was going on with you because your hair texture changed. Yes, it did. And we would walk past people and say, Ooh. 
Oh, but let me, but another thing about it getting ready. Like everybody today, everybody wants to have these bodies. You see everybody's in the gym and running. That stemmed from people were running in the gyms because they didn't want people to get, think that they, they, they had HIV. Right. I agree. Yeah. You spoke a little bit about it. Well, one of the things that we did was uh, we were involved. Well, let me go back this way. I belong to a group of black and white men together. And then we started a group here called NJ, uh, PACT, People of All Colors Together. And um, everybody, this one right here again, <laughs> he, just, he doesn't even have the credit that he deserves. And he doesn't want it, but I'm going to say it and he can slap it later. But we all got together. We went down to the mayor's office. And we had, actually we had people who was in city council who we went and visited. We didn't go down there yelling, screaming, cussing, and how we went down there. Because as professionals, we went down there and talked to them and said, this is what is going on here. And eventually, uh, I can't remember those guys' names, but it was men as well as women that came on board and listened to what we were saying. They actually start coming to the balls to see exactly what we were talking about, what was going on, and someone would speak. Matter of fact, um, Cory Booker, for his first term, actually came to the ball. He came to the ball. Came to the ball to see what was going on and how important that was. And they saw that it was important. And the brief thing is that through those building those relationships, even though I'm giving it to you in two minutes, it took a while to build those relationships to get people really interested in it. And eventually, uh, they did a lot. They started to do a lot for the gay community. They actually have. Uh, they hang the flag, right? Maybe you can speak more to that about what's going on. Well, they have all. a flag raising ceremony and have a week long program, and that makes no different than others. I, I know that uh, people come out for the uh, the march on the Sunday, uh, and people look around and say, "Well, where are all all the people?" But the strategy was that knowing the different communities in Newark, you have to reach them differently, and so that was the goal. We have a week long program. So you're not going to have a big march like they do in New York on, on one day because everything is happening during the week and some of it is in the local communities, in the wards. And that was one thing I learned about Newark. Newark is not like other cities in the no. sense that um, you have divisions along wards and even block by block sometimes and people just don't understand. And even amongst that, the gays. Yeah, yeah, even among the, the gay community as well. It's sometimes it's just block, block, block and that's just the reality. And so rather than fight that, you, you, you understand that in order to reach the people, you have to go into those wards and go into those communities with the people who live there because the other part of that, the reason why they are so separated that way is that outsiders have on, uh, Newark has been uh, uh, well known that when people come in to, to do things in Newark, they usually take their stuff with them and the community is left without the resources to, keep, to continue that fight or continue that struggle. So. Uh, that's one of the things that's great about this uh, Black Lives Matter movement is they they are understanding that and people just got to get connected with that because the Black Ma uh, Black Lives Matters talk about this issue and that's why they have such complaints with the um, lib uh, liberal whites in, the, in our society because liberal whites come in and they want to run things and do things and with your help or with that to help the community but when they leave the people who are left there have the, don't have the skills that they should have they actually in order to more. get things doing. And so that's that's the new movement and that's what people don't understand. That's what people don't connect with. And that's why there's such, you know, issues around uh, uh, around the Black Lives Matter you know, a movement right now. Can, can I speak to the Bowman team? For me, I think that we were ahead of our time in the sense that yeah. There weren't agencies out. And I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of this is just my opinion. It's probably fact, but you can check it yourself. <laughs> what the real deal is that we weren't really open to outsiders. People was dying from AIDS, and it was none about, I mean, we were surviving, and that's what houses did in Jersey. We were living, we were surviving, we were burying hours, you know, we're dropping people off at the hospitals. But when agencies came at us, we had a very unhealthy well, we had an unhealthy fear of anybody that was outside of us because we had been hurt so much. You understand what I'm saying? Back at this time, you could get beat up. The cops would stand there and let you get beat up. The cops would call you faggots and embarrass you if you happen to be a transgendered person. So there was no rights except for some moral rights. Some cops were nicer than others. But in the end, you were still a fag. 
and that's how you were treated. So when the agencies came at ballroom people, we were like the last ones for them to tap into. Now, as far as Project Fire is concerned, they did it differently. They came at us as if, you know, we are all one. But what happened over the years is that agencies found less people to test because they made their money off testing and inclusionists. You know, we need you to come test because every time they tested, the government gave them money. So as you look around now, you see there's hundreds of agencies. And those agencies have ran out, have ran out of people to test. So what they did was they came into the ballroom scene because we were an untapped market. You would come to a ball and find 500 people to test. Mm -hmm. There was no other place where you could get that many gay people in an urban environment. And once they found out where their money was at, they took full advantage of that. Um, GMHC, um, all the New York agencies, some of the founders became millionaires, and we know this. They became millionaires off the backs of blacks and Spanish and whites dying from AIDS. It became a business. And to this day, it's still a business. It's a multi-billion dollar business mixed with the government, the pharmaceutical companies, and the insurance companies. They run it as if it's a business. And don't ever believe that they're doing this out of the kindness of their heart. Yeah. There is profit in being sick. Yeah. I'm a director of hospital support at uh, Mount Sinai. There's millions and millions of dollars that's being spent on testing, patient experience, how we treat you. But guess what? All this, I'm not going to say it all started from AIDS, but AIDS was their foundation for which they're doing all this patient experience. How was your visit? What could we do for you? Because at one time, you couldn't even get in the hospital. I remember at UMD and J, if you wasn't sick enough, they would turn you away. If you could walk away, you out of here. And that's what it was. So the ballroom scene has always had a very uncomfortable relationship with any outside entity that claims to come and help. And it was to our detriment, a lot of times we didn't listen when people were offering us help, but there was also a, a very healthy fear that we knew that we were going to be taken advantage of. Just like Madonna took Vogue. See, stole it from us. I ain't never seen her a day in my life until she made the video, and then, but she was, but we were Vogue in basements, you know. And it's just like anything. Once a group of people, a minority group of people, get it, it be it women, Irish doing the jig, Italian cooking, they take it, make it mass marketing. The next thing you know, you got Chef Boy or I did. You understand what I'm saying? It ain't really Italian, but it just got a little tomato sauce. In it. <laughs> and that's and that's what that was our reality. What made it what made it different? Uh, in fact, uh, I keep uh, being asked even today is about how do we really do that in Newark? Why do, how do we do the fireball? Because there's such strong competition between the houses. You know, the houses uh, in terms of, of competition against each other. You know, they would slash you <laughs> in, in a minute. <laughs> uh, but what we did, as far as Project Fire, we pulled the houses together and let them decide what the ball is going to be. We just and then we worked with them to decide exactly what uh, what what types of things we like to see done, and then they decide what the categories are. And so that what that's what made the fire ball different than any other ball in uh, that happened during that era and even now today. And they're wondering across the nation and other places, well, how do y'all do it in Newark? And we're the, still the, yeah. we're the only ball yeah. that literally have all houses that work together. Work together. Yeah. Because there's, there's a lot of competition amongst houses. Um, it's not always a healthy competition either. Yeah, right. It's just competition. <laughs> Once you hit the runway, you are food. Well, you, you know, are to be eight. eight. To go back, and I know you might have a problem, <laughs> you probably got one, I'll make this quick. To go back even in the beginning, when you talk, talk about um, James, James, Don, and I were also on the governor's first HIV planning group right. in in New Jersey. And they, mm -hmm. we had to fight to get that money. They wanted to send that money to the kindergarten mm -hmm. for and, and, and show them and make it, and make it out of blocks. They wanted to send that money everywhere but to the gay community. So the eventually, yeah, and I'm a, I'm a firm believer that you when you're invited to the table, you better show up. Because if you don't show up, somebody's going to make a decision for you. Mm -hmm. And when they make that decision, and you were invited, you didn't show up, it ain't nobody's fault but your own. Stop crying. 
take what they give you. But we fought to get that money so that we could come here and we had to sit down. We scratched grip tail, we scratched our head. We didn't know how we were gonna do it. Because you can't just walk into the because I know being a gay man, I couldn't just I didn't trust everybody. You know, my family would have threw me out if they knew. I think they knew anyway. But <laughs> you know, but you know how you they say you don't tell you don't say you don't but anyway, it, 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 it was a it was a job. It was a job. But sometimes, and I, and I have to bring religion to them, sometimes they just got to pray and say, God, send me the right people. And here you walk in the door, you walk in the door, you walk in the door. Angel, before he did, uh, passed away in 2005. And there's a whole lot of other people that are not here who did a hell of a job right. of putting this all together, too. And Maggie, as Bernie said. they're not here because they're not here. Because they're not here. Right. You know, they're not here because they're not here. But I, there was a lot of hard work in the beginning, uh, a, a fight. But I... I just want to make one thing clear. It's not a black and white issue because I don't want people to separate that and think it's black and it's white. It's not, it's not a black and white issue. It's the people who are making decisions about where our money goes. It's the power and the power That's list. Right. And it's not about color. And once you put color on there, you miss the mark. That's right. I use black because at the time, well, at this still, yeah. they're the power list. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> Women, the power list. And remember, there were white men at the top of the chain that was making decisions. And it reminds you much of the Republican Party about women and their bodies. They want to make decisions about women, and Ronald Reagan wouldn't even mention AIDS. And they consider him one of the greatest presidents. What an asshole. He didn't do shit. He did nothing. Not for the urban community. He really didn't. He didn't mention AIDS, and people were dying left and right. All out the street. Another perfect example, Ed Koch, a gay man. She showed Hated. Hated gay people. And was tricking on Christmas Street. Yeah. But you understand what I'm saying? So again, we were fighting battles in our own homes with the gay people, with the people in power. And I can't emphasize enough when I put their hands up and imagine you sitting there with six of your friends and three of them die. You understand what I'm saying? And people, and I'll never forget, the Village Boys had this picture. I'll never forget. They had an illustration, and it was called the Blue, Blue, Blue something. And they, it was a, a caricature of a, a man sitting in the tub, and he drank. He, he was dying. He knew he was dying because he had lost maybe 150 pounds. He was only like 80 pounds wet. And the only way he could eat or drink is that he sat on the toilet or was in the tub. So he would drink the blue Caribbean drink, you know, the drink with the, um, he wanted that his last days with the um, umbrella and the cherry. And as he drank the blue drink, it came up out of him. Mm -hmm. So it was passing through. So the water turned blue. That's suffering. Imagine drinking water and it's coming straight out you. Imagine eating and it's just coming straight out. There was nothing to hold it. And it was nothing. It was nothing to go to a person's house and you'd be like, oh my God, they're dying. And half the people didn't even go to doctors because they were scared of the news. I remember, do anybody remember Cheryl Moore? Sure, she's Cheryl, she was, you know Cheryl, is it Miller or Moore? No. Cheryl Moore. No, no. Miller. 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 Miller, Cheryl Miller, Miller. Miller. one of the Miller. best HIV nurses in the country. And she, I remember I was scared to go get tested. To be honest with you, I didn't go get tested until like maybe about 10 years ago. And then I, I had guilt that, I, that I'm a survivor, that I'm, that I'm negative. I'm, I went through therapy because I'm negative, because I lived. I survived the onslaught. Because I call it, to me, it was our concentration camp. And Cheryl would tell people, everybody's not ready to be tested. Because you're not ready for the answer. You know, and like you said, when you would tell people, and people would go home and jump off roofs. Jump off roofs. Imagine your friend, you'd be like, what is you? And they jump off the roof. They kill themselves because of a disease that was killing them anyway. Because the, the stigma and the ostracism that came from having AIDS was, oh, it was so devastating, you would be stuck. Imagine being stuck and you would scream and nobody could hear you. And that's what it felt like. That's what it felt like. Well, there's, there are just a couple of things that I wanted to mention. One is that um, this work is, has been so hard. And for me, it's been so hard because I'm a Vietnam veteran. 
And if you understand what happened in Vietnam, you know that we lost a lot of men of color, boys of color, during that war as well. And I was a frontline medic, so I watched that and I was participated in that happening. And this was uh, in 1966, 67, when I was in Vietnam. And uh, while I was in Vietnam, I was watching uh, Newark, the 67 riots. I was watching Newark burn while I was in Vietnam. So that was part of the pain that I came to this struggle with in 1980. And what happened to me that was very uh, in some ways lucky for me, is that the call that was made was made to MACT New York at the time that in 1980 when we learned about this grid stuff, I had a, a friend of mine, I was Director of Office of Veterans Affairs and I worked in Veterans Services here at the university, so we had a network of veterans offices throughout the country and Mike Gold was the director at SCUNY and his sister's his wife's sister was the wife of Dr. Uh, Goddard, who was from NIMH. And he learned about this disease, and he needed a cohort of gay men to research. And what happened to me, and that what reminded me of how I think that I never contracted the disease, because in 1982, I became part of a study group in New York of 16 men. And for 30 years, they followed us. And the first question they would ask us was our sexual behavior. And I'm a North Carolina boy from, you know, <laughs> from the black church, and I'm going to tell the truth. So if I'm going to be telling the truth, I better watch what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sexually and otherwise. So James Freeman was watching his P's and Q's when he went out sexually. <laughs> so I could tell the truth. And I think that you know, that was my saving grace. Because I too have you know, tested uh, negative throughout that time. That's great. So yeah, that's what happened to me. But the other point that I wanted to raise about this in terms of the painful stuff is also the great stuff in the sense that we were smart enough as a group to form a uh, underground medical dis, uh, dispension system. Yes. <laughs> so you talk about that. So Peter, Peter would tell you about it, that one. 